Uh, maybe we'll start with some introductions. And um, Mark, we'll start with you down there. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Costain. I work for a company called Believe. So we're a distribution company based in Canada, um, but also in, um, we have different, um, we operate in different territories across the world. Um, so I believe it's at 52 at this point. Um, so consider, Believe is considered one of the largest independent um, distributors in the world for music. Um, so yeah, I've been in this industry, um, I look young, but <laughs> I've been in this industry for 20 years. Um, so, you know, my passion is independent artists and, um, you know, helping independent artists with their distribution. Um, just even, even those that, I, you know, I don't necessarily have distribution deals with, um, uh, I will mentor on the side and help them with that. So it's a huge passion of mine. So happy to be here. Where are you from, Mark? I'm sorry. I should say where That's I'm all right. from. I should say where I'm from. Um, so I'm based in Toronto. Um, and that's where I work out of, um, we have a off, we just open up an office downtown. So yeah, happy to be here. Laurie. Hey, I'm Laurie Stanton. I'm a COO of Outside Music and Next Door Records. Uh, two record labels originally from Toronto were now spread out. We're based all over the place. We have offices in outside Halifax, in the middle of nowhere in Montreal, and then outside Ottawa in the middle of nowhere and outside Toronto in the middle of nowhere. Um, so we get around. Um, outside Music has been a distribution company since the mid-90s. Uh, we started a record label in the early 2000s with bands like The Sadies, Super Friends, people like that. Our current roster for Outside includes artists like Jill Barber, uh, Tammy Nielsen, Doug Paisley, Abigail LaPelle. So sort of a more adult-oriented singer-songwriter roots um, label. Next Door Records, we started just over four years ago. In that four years, we've signed about 16 artists, so it's been a very, very busy time. We're growing really quickly. Our roster um, is mainly based around women and um, people who are gender diverse, people from different cultural backgrounds. We're trying to really represent the communities that our artists are in. Um, main art, like, there's so many, like 16, I can't list everybody. Um, we do The Weather Station, Charlotte Cornfield, Lydia Prasad, uh, Land of Talk, uh, Super Duty Tough Work, Living Hour, Bells Lars, like I could just go on and on and on. I love every single one of them. Uh, so yeah, so that's that. Um, so as COO, I basically run the day-to-day -day operations of both labels, keeping everybody on track. I also run our international distribution and sales operation and a label services division. Just a couple things. A few things. <laughs> really keep my heart's holding racing. those timelines down. My heart is racing, thinking like, oh my God, I do all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> a couple hats. Just Coming to, just to some few. conclusions here. Yeah, it's like, what, why, am I, why am I here? How do I have the time? <laughs> yeah. uh, and you're from outside of Ottawa. Yeah, I'm from Fitzroy Harbor, Ontario, Canada, which is a village of about 300 people, about 40 minutes from downtown Ottawa. So you can do it from anywhere. Don't let anyone tell you different. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, hey everyone, I'm your moderator, uh, Jessica, and I'm, I'm from Edmonton, and I'm the CEO of Neon Moon Records, which is a pretty brand new label as well, a um, couple of years old now. Uh, we've got about eight artists, and it's been, it's been pretty busy. Uh, we're kind of a hybrid model that's uh, fee for service. Um, so we try to help artists get the grants to fund the fee. Uh, and then we have more of a distro deal type of back end where it's a little less on the, on the split uh, because I kind of thought we should just take the money from the government and then less on the less for the artist. So I, I, I've enjoyed seeing how the model works. It's kind of, it's kind of a new, new model in terms of in Canada, I think it's a little bit unique, but uh, it's been really fun seeing how that works. And uh, some of the artists that we've worked with, um, a lot of them have actually showcased this weekend. So uh, Emily Patterson's playing today at Heritage Coffee, uh, Star Painters, Shayla Miller, The Dust Collectors, uh, 
Cynthia Hamer from Edmonton. So we're a little bit of rootsy Americana, singer songwriter, folk kind of stuff. So I think we got a good, a good selection here today. And I'm really happy to be moderating this panel and hosting, hosting our guests from outside of Alberta. Um, maybe I'll start with a, a question to the audience. Um, is anyone here currently on a label or with a distribution company? Nice. <laughs> That's yeah, it's like you're like all three on a label with a distribution company, run yeah. the label. No, that's good. It's good to know kind of like, you know, um, who we're talking to. So is anyone here looking up like for a label or distribution support for an upcoming release? Nice. Nice. And um, if you don't know, uh, kind of the, 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 the vibe in Western Canada is we don't have a ton of industry infrastructure, but we have a ton of talent. So uh, it's kind of the wild west out here. Um, <laughs> Literally. And that's why things like uh, events like Music uh, music Calgary Sound Off is a really <coughs> good way to get some folks in and checking out all this talent. So um, I think that's a, a bit of a, a demonstration of kind of what's going on here. Um, maybe I'll throw this one to you, Lori. Um, you know, why do you think, why do you need a label if, if anyone can just release a song on, uh, on DSPs, which is a digital streaming platform, so Spotify, Apple Music? Not everyone does need a label, to be honest. Um, if you have the money to support yourself, so it can be your full-time job and you don't have to deal with all of the little intricacies, maybe you don't need a label. Um, but the reality is, is that for most artists, they do need that support. Um, we find with artists that even have been in the industry for a very long time, you know, they have the general knowledge to, to do it themselves, but they realize, like, you put out an album and 18 months later, the landscape has totally changed. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn everything from the beginning all over again. Mm -hmm. And that's when artists realize, okay, I do really need you. That's when it makes a difference. It's just to have that team behind you that can take all the box, make sure all the boxes are ticked, make sure mm -hmm. that everything is in place <laughs> and do all the legwork so that you can focus on what is most important, which is your craft. Nice. Mark, do you have anything to, to add to that? I mean, yeah, I think um, as we were discussing earlier, I think it's based on, you know, what you as an artist need, right? So if you need the support, um, the team around you, um, then it's, you know, a label or distributor. And, you know, often a label and distributor are two different things, right? So, you know, for instance, for the company I work with, you know, we don't provide label services. Um, we just provide the support, right? So there's a couple different aspects um, where we, you know, we have a team that will pitch for playlists. Um, we also have a video, what we call video channel manager, which helps on the video side of things. Um, and then we have a label manager, which is like your day-to-day -day contact that can walk you through the process of a, of a new release process um, and offer feedback on your campaign your and, and just offer that overall support piece. And then we have um, a support um, team as well, which is like technical problems, financial questions, things of that nature. So it's kind of like if you're an artist and you're deciding, do I go with the distributor, do I go with the label? I think you just have to kind of do your homework and figure out what is it that you need that's going to support your career the best. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. And timing that capacity building too, right? Like, you know, are you at the level where these are sustainable things, right? Like a manager's commission, a booking agent, yeah. like, you know, a label's cut. Are, are, the, are those gonna help you at the time that you, that you need them to, I guess? Yeah, great point. Um, and, and to your point about sort of the, this side of the industry changes so much just with the tech, it, it being kind of tech focused. Um, you know, there's like 100,000 songs released a day. So it's sort of like our jobs are, how do we cut through <coughs> all of that how do we present our artists uh releases essentially on a silver platter <laughs> like here's the entire plan from you know we're delivering the first single but 
Here's the entire plan for after that, for the, the, for the second single. Here's all the assets. Here's all the entire plan for the album. Here's the video plan and mixed in there. Here's all the marketing drivers and kind of just like the silver platter thing. So Lori, I know kind of queen of the timelines, you know, how, how do you really set all of that up for, you know, maximizing the timing to, to maximize sort of the, the, the success? I think um, my philosophy, I, I started, I was in distribution, physical distribution for many years, a couple of decades. And uh, the digital world is an entirely different thing. But when I switched over to the label side of the business, my whole philosophy at the time was to be the point of least resistance. So to do that for your distributor, which is like your key partner in both physical and digital, is to be organized and to have everything on time and to like hit every marker that they set out and do it before it's expected. So that when opportunities do arise and you're up against artists that are like more impressive than you, that have bigger budgets than you, but artists that aren't hitting timelines, you're gonna be the one that gets chosen because you're the easiest to work with. And you can rise above really quickly by doing that, by just having all of your ducks in a row and having that plan in advance and then forcing yourself to stick to the plan. Mark, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely agree with what Lori's saying as far as like, just having all your ducks in, in line. Um, you know, I, I come across way too many artists that are like, give me their assets and like, I want it out in two weeks. <laughs> and, and like, work your magic. And it's kind of like... Eight weeks. Yeah. yeah. Eight weeks. So basically, you know, minimum for us is, is you know, four weeks um, to get within our, our, our pitching cycle, stuff like that. But, um, you know, as far as like, if we're talking an album campaign, you know, we want to have that at least six weeks before the first single drops, right? So um, it's all about the planning part of it. Um, you want to give yourself the best optimal chance to succeed. Um, you know, nothing's guaranteed if we're specifically talking about playlists or anything like that. It's still subjective. It's still editorial. Um, but you want to give your you want you to set yourself up for to to succeed, right? So you want to give yourself the best shot. Um, and that's why we ask for all the information up front. You know, what's your timeline? What's your rollout? Um, and then that we, we can work with that. I say that's one of the differences between having a label that works with your distributor for you or being direct with a distributor is because we do build in extra time to make sure that every kink is worked out. Yeah. And if you're, if you're going direct with a distributor, you'll kind of work those kinks out for them. Yeah. <laughs> It's like you can either depend on your label to do it or depend on your distributor to do, to do it, but somebody's got to do it. So you got to give them enough time. Yeah, I mean, there's to make all, that work. Yeah, like, to make sure all, that everything was delivered at the right bit rate. You know, right? we I've worked with like exceptions, like where you know something's landed a big sink, for instance, right? And it's a rush to get that up on the DSPs, and like we got to capitalize on this mm. success that's happening right now. Um, so there are exceptions where that like six week, four week rule or whatever is not going to be optimal. Um, so like there are exceptions, but again, if you want to give yourself the best chance to succeed, it's getting that information in early. Yeah. And have the, have the exceptions be a rarity so that when you do need something rushed, people take it seriously. They're like, oh shit, we do need to do this. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, because right. well, this, artist, this artist delivers all of the time. So when they need something done last minute, it's gonna get done. Yeah, exactly. Don't, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. be the last minute guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark, you brought up a couple good points. The, uh, the time, maybe let's talk about the, the timelines now. So that was to sort of upload, distribute, what about um, sort of a, an album arc between, say, a couple singles and, and, and the album? Um, what, is, what is the timing between single one and two to an album? I mean, Lori's, Lori's answer might be different than mine, but... Go ahead. I'll, um, I'll say my different answer after yours. Yeah. <laughs> so for us, like, coming from a distributor, like, from a playlist perspective, I guess, like, you mm -hmm. know, pitching for playlists... I would say the minimum between singles is three weeks. Um, and uh, the, the reason I say that is like, um, 
You know, you, you don't want to kill the momentum of a single by going too quick with the next single, right? Mm -hmm. So often, you know, I've seen it firsthand where, you know, an artist release releases a single, the release is your second single, so the first single is now pulled from that playlist or, yeah. or it like kills any momentum, right? So I would say that. And again, for as a distributor, um, I would love to see the plan, the full plan up front. So it's like single one's dropping here, single two's coming here, single three, and then this is when the album drops. Um, so we can present that when we're presenting the first single um, to the DSPs. I actually, I totally agree with you. Like three weeks is like a minimum. Yeah. Or yeah, the minimum amount you want a lot. And part of that is, is like for any of you that have Spotify for artists, you know, there's the pitching tool in Spotify for artists. You can only pitch one track at a time. So you need to give them a two week window on that. So if you encroach on that at all, mm -hmm. you, you're going to lose a pitch on one of them. And it's going to be the one that was in there first. Mm -hmm. So that's why you need a, like an absolute minimum of three weeks. Um, as a general rule, we schedule singles three to five weeks apart if it's part of an album campaign. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do, depending on the artist or, and the length of the release, like three to five singles, including the release week focus track, which is what comes out on that day. Mm -hmm. And maybe also the asset, like if there's a music video asset tied to that, single you want to give that a little bit of time like time too but yeah essentially you're not not cutting anything off at the knees in order, you know what why are you firing these out i guess like yeah. what is tying back to the strategy a little bit yeah. what's the what's the urgency like you can kind of overwhelm it overwhelm a campaign really easily if you put too much out at once mm -hmm. yeah. and burn people out it's a lot to also wave and be like here's a thing here's a thing um and then also depending kind of on budget, right? Like with each release, do you have a budget f to push that out? You know, if you don't have a huge budget, then to fire out a whole bunch of singles with no budget might be tough to accomplish what you're trying to do. Yeah, for each release, like you want to have a plan and it can be like the cheapest plan imaginable. Mm -hmm. it does, they don't all necessarily need to have meta advertising or mm -hmm. marquee advertising or whatever you wanted to call it now. Um, but you might need a budget for visual assets, for content creation, for a video. So that might help you decide how many singles you want to do, because it's like, how many can I afford to support in yeah. advance of an album release? Yeah. Sorry, you, you had a quick question. Yeah, in regards to kind of like plan, doing the single release plan before the album, is there ever a case where you guys have found that, you know, let's say you drop the first single and that one just had a crazy amount of momentum, like it's, it's just blowing up? Or you'll push back the second single just to let that have more breathing room? Or do you kind of stick to like a maximum plan of like you were saying, like five weeks kind of at that max and three weeks at the minimum? Or will you push it? Um, when I set up a campaign at digital, we set it up, we set it up once. We don't change it. It's like, this is the plan. You stick with the plan. You get momentum, you use that momentum on the next single. The, the, you don't get dropped off playlists because you have a new single. Like, it, it does happen for something like a New Music Friday or something like that, but those only last a week anyway, so who cares? Yeah. You know, you're, if, if you're doing really well on a playlist, they keep you on there based on any number of factors that they don't necessarily tell us about, like things like the skip rate. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, if people are clicking on it and going to look at your profile, you're more likely to stay on that playlist. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's like just Sorry. charge through. Just to answer your question, there have been circumstances where, you know, we have moved stuff back a little bit. Um, and that is just strictly because um, it was three weeks, maybe we moved it to five weeks or something like that. Because there is so much happening with that single, we want to keep it focused on that. Kind of for a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, but like changes to the overall plan, I agree. Like we don't want to yeah. be changing it multiple times because that really is what we're presenting, right? So if we have to keep presenting uh, alterations of that plan, then things get kind of askew. Yeah, like you want to be seen as a label or as an artist, you want to be seen as a reliable partner. So yeah. if you're making changes to your plan on a regular basis, they can't depend on you, you know? They might, ha they might already have said, like, there might be someone at Apple Editorials, like, I'm going to put this track in this playlist on this date, and you go change the date. You know, do they pick up on that? Do they know? They have such an onslaught of information that 
It's just like, no, you just, you have a plan, you stick with the plan. <laughs> Do you think that that is the same, the same goes for an independent distro kid release where there isn't that uh, relationship necessarily? I think structure is always important. And that's why I'm COO. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not everybody can be a creative. Like, I can't do what you guys do. You know, I'm the first to admit it. But, <laughs> I mean, I think it's a, I just think it's really important, regardless of where you're at in your career, to be on top of it and hold that, hold it down. And if you can't hold it down yourself, you find people to surround yourself with who can help you do that. And maybe that's why you need a label. Accountability. Maybe you need a manager. Maybe you need a label. There's a, you know, maybe you need both. Some people definitely need both. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question around, um, so I'm working on my album release and I've got five singles out now, um, R&B, hip hop, pop, mm -hmm. and um, it's love sick music. So I mean, there's a lot of heartbreak, there's a lot of like feel there. However, the holiday season is something where I actually don't feel that much heartbreak. I feel there's, there's so much love floating around. So I want to release a uh, holiday music, so two track, like, you know, and it's kind of touching on some things I think we need to right now. Is it, essentially this straight up question is, is that a good idea? Am I interrupting, like, I think artistically I can work it into my album mode and like tell that story of like, this is what I do to bring myself up, up throughout all this heartbreak at this time in the holiday season, but like, marketing wise if you're in the middle of an album campaign i wouldn't interrupt it with something else okay. because you're trying there's a message attached to your album campaign and you need to stick with that and present one project at a time i <coughs> think you can do different things yeah. but i would do it next year after do it next season like and if you're going to release something holiday related first week of November, no later. Because they that's when they holiday playlists go up and you want to make sure that you're making yourself eligible as soon as those come out. So it's released first week of November mm. or not submitted? No, no, no. You yeah. want to submit it like in September right. okay. so that they have they know that it's coming, it's tagged as holiday. Right. Um, and yeah, that's that would I, I don't want to slow you down any. No, but it's like if you have a message that you're pursuing with your album campaign, yeah. you have to stick on message throughout that campaign. Because you're kind of in the middle of telling a story right yeah. now. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I have like, after years and years of relying on other people to make my music and stuff, I finally took the plunge and taught myself to produce and like I'm having a bit of a late life, um, not late life, but you know what I mean? Like I bring renaissance, renaissance of having new music out. And every year I've, for the past four, I've put out an album on the Friday of May long weekend. And this is my like plan going forward. And even if it doesn't make sense industry wise, like it's just what I want to do and it's who I want to be. And I really kind of want this thing to be like, even if you haven't thought of me for 364 days, and even if you didn't see the ad, if you're like one of those people who actually give a crap that I exist, I want you to unfold your chair, think of Queen Victoria and then think of me. Like that's just my idea of it. Is that like, how can I leverage that, or is that a terrible plan? Or I think congratulations on keeping releasing stuff every 365 days, <laughs> because as soon as you go much more than that, you basically cease to exist as far as the DSPs go. Like after 18 months, you're basically a new artist to them again. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on being prolific enough to not fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. um, as to whether or not it's a marketing campaign, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it, it, it will speak strongly to your existing fans. And is if that's it, who you're trying to talk to. Is that to, a good time of year? Is, May is a great time to be releasing yeah. stuff. As far as, I was talking about this with somebody yesterday. It's like, I don't kind of buy into there's a bad time of year to release. We release year round with very short windows of exceptions, depending on format, like physical. There's certain times of year where you don't release a physical format, like April, because yeah. that's record store day. And it's like, why do that to yourself? You can't compete. <laughs> No matter who you are, you can't compete. So there's little windows like that, but I think you choose whenever works best for you. So yeah. record store day is a double-edged sword. It's good for oh. in one sense, but it, dude, you don't want to. You don't want that noise. 
No, we, well, you, you really don't want to compete with Record Store Day releases, and it's not because they're great quality releases necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's because uh, the retailers that do participate, all of their budgets go into buying that product, so they don't have any money left to take chances on indie artists. Mm. You know, it just wipes out any chance for an indie artist to compete at a physical retail store level. So we avoid April and early May physical product releases, kind of like the plague. And I've also, like, I usually have make a couple of videos, and one will come, like, with the album, and I'll put one out, like, Labor Day or something, just to be like, hey, just in case, is that, like, a good schedule? I don't know, summer, people... I, I mean, if, if your main audience is in Canada, then I think that timing is fine. If, you're, if your main audience is in Europe, I wouldn't be releasing stuff in the summer because they just fuck off, basically, yeah. for the whole summer. So I would probably avoid that. Um, but if your audience is in Canada and you're focusing on people around here, you know. It's go. not too late to like just wait four months and then put something else out. Like, hey, remember? I put it on. No, I don't know. I think it's always good to have album assets safe for after campaign like for years I'm talking a lot I'm sorry for years like people didn't know how digital worked labels didn't know artists didn't know digital didn't even know how it worked so you would do a campaign you do like single 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 album and then there would be nothing and then everyone's like wondering why retail sales dropped off and it's like well retail starts on the day your album comes out and you stop putting out assets on the day your album came out so you need to be holding back some visual assets, some audio assets that you can use after the fact to keep people interested so that they are going into record stores if you're doing a physical product. So I'm a proponent of having a, like a video asset after the fact. Where you place it is, you know, it's your call. You have yeah. to go by feel, but that's just how I look at it. Thank you. Nice. All right. Um, I wanted to just kind of go, go back on the on the release strategy, um, how important, or can you explain how overall goals for an, a release would inform the strategy? Oh, sorry, I'm thinking how important the is it to have <laughs> goals for the release? It's really important. I mean, it's really important to have goals in life, so, you know, <laughs> it applies. Mm -hmm. um, but what your goals are could be entirely are entirely personal to each artist. Mm -hmm. You know, for some artists, it's like they just want to get on this one playlist that they know that their friends listen to, or they just want to get on this one festival because that's what the festival they grew up going to, or like this is the radio station they listen to, or that's the record store that their friends go to. Like it's a, it's in Sonic Boom. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, mm -hmm. I've made it. You know, everybody has a different list of goals. Um, and I just think you should have something because you should have something to, to mark. Otherwise you don't really, I, I should have been in the confidence workshop yesterday. <laughs> they, if you don't, if you don't set goals, you have a tendency to like, you, you, you hit the goal and then you just kind of like keep going. You just, you don't acknowledge it. You don't celebrate yourself. And, and I think that's a mistake and I think it's, it's extremely important especially for an artist to say like I did this mm. you know or I didn't do it but I'm this much closer you yeah. know so like next time I can keep this goal I can hit this goal and maybe I'll hit the next one just to mm -hmm. have something to kind of motivate yourself to keep going benchmark yeah so to speak Perfect. right yeah. and I know some artists will be like I don't actually know if that was a successful release <coughs> or not because they didn't really have any any sort of goals set to start with. So it's really important when you're starting a campaign to think like, what, you know, what would I be happy with if, you know, to happen during this, you know? And it, and it also relates to all the different types of um, parts of your career, right? Like the release is a pro promotional tool. So, you know, would you be happy with X number of people coming to the release show or the tour, you know? that would inform, you know, that sort of live strategy. Would you, would you be happy with X number more followers or this many overall streams on the album? That would probably inform a DSP strategy. Uh, would you be happy selling this many units or pre-selling this many units? You know, then that would be the strategy. 
right? Um, not everybody is working with a huge budget too. So being able to focus in on, on those kinds of things um, to help achieve the goals uh, is what I would, I would recommend. And I think like if, if you're in the audience and you're an artist, it's like you could just be like, I don't know what my goals are or I don't know what real, a realistic goal should be. I mean, that, at that point, that's when you talk to your label and mm-hmm. you talk to anyone in your team or any of um, your contemporaries, your distributor, and say, like, what do you think is a realistic goal yeah. for this? You know, like, um, if they might have they might have ideas that you don't have or they might have they might think that you have more potential mm-hmm. than you than or or they might give you more credit than you're giving yourself yeah. they might be able to help you set more realistic goals or they'll dial you back and be like 500 percent is well, a lot to gain it's like we don't <laughs> need to press 3,000 lps on right now i think that's the key right there is like you know i, I think it's super important as well to set goals like as an artist like because you want to you want something to strive for, right? Um, but I'm also there not to like rain on anybody's brain, but I'm also there as sort of a, a realistic view as well, right? So it's like we can talk it through at the beginning of the campaign, what are your goals? But maybe I would say like, okay, maybe that's not realistic. Or you know, we were talking about, you know, for instance, a lot of weight, like in my world, is put on playlists, right? So. Um, you know, if you're not hitting a playlist, like I deal with artists sometimes where they see that as a failure. Well, you know, my thing would be, okay, well, what else, like, what else is your goals? Like, you know, maybe, you know, increasing your followers on Spotify, you know, each single that you're putting out as part of your album rollout has incrementally more streams organically than the one. That's a win. That's a win to me. Um... You're not 100%, um, you know, depending on playlists. You know, the way I look at playlists is, is like it's it's a bonus. It's, you know, mm-hmm. it shouldn't be at your end all on, on everything, um, you know, as was pointed out. New Music Friday is great for, for stature. Sword. Such a double-edged sword. But it's one week you're in, the next week you're out, you know, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just look at like sort of looking at the bigger picture, and like that's what I'm happy to discuss with artists at the beginning, or like when I first sign them or whatever. Is like that's one of the first questions I ask. Like, what are your goals? Like, Mm -hmm. what do you foresee if we do a deal? What do you expect? Because if maybe if they come to me and say like, I want to be on the cover of this and I like billboard, and (laughs) then I'm like, maybe it's not, you know, because with that those kind of expectations from the hub. Maybe, maybe a deal isn't the right thing to do um, for me, you know, or mm-hmm. for the, for the company. So, you yeah. know, just kind of having those conversations for sure. It's hard because mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of artists see playlisting in the same way the rest of us see social media. It's like that dopamine hit of like I'm on this playlist, and not all playlists are well targeted. Mm-hmm. And if the playlist isn't well targeted, something like New Music Friday Canada, it's kind of double edged sword. It's like Yes, you're getting exposed to a large audience, but a lot of that audience is not in your interested in your genre. So they're hitting skip, and that can affect your algorithm long term. So it's like it's cool to get, but if you don't have a big follower base to support it, it can actually it can slow you down a little bit sometimes. Yeah. So like playlisting is great if you can make something out of it, if you can get your follower count up and stuff like that. <coughs> so when I talk to artists and they're, they're like, oh, I want to be on this big playlist that has like a million followers and it's based in the U.S. And it's like, we're going to get there, but like, let's focus on some of the smaller playlists that are more attuned to your style of music or your geographic area and build from oh, there. Right now, yeah. yeah, because those are the people that are going to buy tickets to your shows. They're going to follow you on social media. They're going to be part of your crowd. And it's like, it's a lot easier to turn those people into fans and into fans that spend money and support your career than it is by just going to a giant playlist where you're a nobody and, you, and you're not making that necessarily making that connection. So you really, like, it's all about turning people into fans first. That is the biggest obstacle and the biggest goal at this point yeah if it's us it's like 
is the artist in that market, like, mm -hmm. who have you hired to be targeting that market? Yeah. So, question. Is there ever a worry that you can end up on those playlists organically and that it affect you negatively? And if so, is there ways to avoid that happening? It never affects you so negatively that you wouldn't want to be there <laughs> okay. necessarily. Like, it's still nice to be there, even if it's just for the dopamine hit for the artist. It's like, <laughs> You know, I'll see that happen, and they're and, I'm, and they're like, yeah, New Music Friday, and I'm like, you're at number 99 out of 100, and so oh my god, and so no. It, no, 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 so it's for never... a little, so it's never a truly bad thing. Like, there's always some positive that comes out of it, but it's just like, like for an artist on the outside label, it's like I would so much rather them get Folk and Friends that has a following of like a hundred thousand people than have them get New Music Friday that has, I don't know, a million and something because like they're going to get so much more out of being on Folk and Friends. It's just kind yeah. of like being at the wrong party. Yeah. yeah. It's not, not bad. Yeah, just to expand on that, like, I don't think there's ever, it's never a bad thing to be on a playlist, and it's never, um, yeah, like it's not a negative. Um, you know, there's different opportunities as well. Like sometimes, like, when you're talking about organically reaching on a playlist, sometimes they funnel to other playlists, right? It's almost like a feeder. To it's like, like an umbrella of major genres into sub-genres. So like, if you're doing well on this playlist, you, like you might this. get picked up yeah. on another playlist and so forth. So there's definitely advantages to it as well. So. From $1.50 to $2. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, first of all, thank you guys for this. I'm Scott. I just have a question for you guys. Um, I've seen bands that I admire who are doing things that I would like to be doing in the future, just coming back to goals. They've released a couple of singles that don't appear to be part of an album cycle, or if they are, like the album would be coming out six months to a year later. And like one thing for my band and I is like we just released a new EP in June and we're going to record a new album in the new year. Something that we've talked about as a possibility <coughs> is releasing some singles, you know, like probably in May or June, so that we're still coming up on DSPs about a year after our last album was released. Is, um, sorry, I just tried to write this down. Um, just to keep ourselves relevant, sort of like what you were talking about earlier, we might not release the album for six months to a year after that, though. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to, like, if that would be a good strategy or just what you'd have to say about that as a potential strategy for us. And Scott, just tell them what your, like, genre primarily is. I play in a band called Beta Boys, and we're, like, 1980s synth pop and new wave. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're really good. I love that. I was really, yeah. Sweet. I'm, I'm down. We'll try. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe Mark's better to talk to this um, from a label perspective it's like we never want there to be too long between releases you know okay. because yeah. what's what's really important specifically at Spotify is they want to see people visiting your profile on a regular basis yeah. they want to know that like there's still some activity going on there so not speaking to your situation specifically but like we'll have an artist do a cover in the summer which is a quieter time for releases you know just to keep them active just to have them there, there be some kind of motion going on we've definitely talked about that too as a something we could do yeah okay. so i don't think it's a terrible idea i mean do you plan to put the the singles that you're releasing six months out you're going to put those on the album Great question yeah i think so yeah, I mean, you could you can do that. I mean, I've certainly done that. Um, we did a Jill Barber campaign. Uh, her she put out an album called Homemaker, and we weren't putting it out until January of this past year. So, was it January? I don't remember when we put it out. Anyways, it was. It didn't come out until 2023. Anyways, and I put we put out a single in 2020 in the spring of 2022 that was on that album because it was. It was a perfect Mother's Day single. Like it was like this needs to come out. It's like the album's not done, it doesn't matter. We're just gonna put this out because the timing is right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it did really, really well. And then we were months away from even starting the album campaign. The That's album campaign didn't where start till like September. Mm -hmm. But we still included it on the album. Okay. Um, there is a limit to the number of singles you can put 
you can release off an album. It's like 50% for grat tracks. For like cats, that. yeah. So the, you have to be careful there. It would be kind of like two probably. Okay, Just yeah. spaced out, like, obviously, like, what, what you guys are saying over three to five weeks, but maybe even six, like, I don't know. Yeah. Just think about six different possibilities. Fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. you can spread yeah. it out. Thank you, guys. Just, like, what, what are your goals for the release, like, and what is the goal for the next release? Like, where is the, what is, what are you leading to? Yeah. Uh, and then, sort of, like, with the Mother's Day, you know, thing, it's like, can you capitalize on anything mm -hmm. along with these releases? And mm -hmm. yeah, what are your goals? That kind of informs the strategy back. So okay, thank you. Really it's different. It that. is different for every yeah artist. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, interested to add on to that. Um, kind of a two-part question, but firstly, uh, the covers. So let's say you release all your singles. Can covers also build momentum to your album? Yes, yeah. and the way they do that is because if you can, f if if your cover gets out there and does half decently well, which can take a while because covers don't immediately get playlisted first week usually, usually takes a little while before they kind of percolate out into playlisting. Um, if you're picking up new fans and new audience, there'll be that many more people who will be engaged who will get on your release radar and hear your your next single. Then, so it all builds. It all it's all like it all builds one on top of the other mm -hmm. but with covers specifically um, if you're putting out a cover you can't have the same expectations that you would have with putting out a single of your own it's good they're very different things yeah. and it is I don't you can speak to this it's kind of harder to target for a cover they kind of have to happen organically if they're gonna get picked up for editorial and it happens to us all the time I've put out Abigail Lapel did a cover of The Weeknd's Blinding Lights, beautiful piano cover. It was out for about three weeks before it made like some big cover playlists. Yeah. Um, and then Justin Rutledge did a cover of As It Was, which is Harry Styles. And we put it out in August and it got playlisted with Apple Chill Covers, which is the big one, in November. And, it, and out of nowhere and we don't know why. So with covers, it's, they're very unpredictable. It, it does take a lot longer time. And I, it, from my experience, um, you know, some of the artists I work with, they're putting out covers like off cycle. So like in between mm -hmm. album or rollouts or whatever, it's like to keep their fans engaged. Um, it's like, here, here's, here's a single. Um, yeah. And totally on, with Lori on, in this sense where it's like the same expectations, like should be altered a bit, like in the sense like it takes a lot longer to get any traction, but just look at it as like you're feeding your fans with content, right? So. I would also like be selective about what covers you do, because yeah. although you're doing something off campaign, you can put it out after your album's out, three, six months later you do a cover and you tie that back by saying like, I was listening to this when mm -hmm. I was writing my record, mm -hmm. you know, so that you're, that you still have a way to tie it back to your record. Say like, these were influences of mine and you can put out a couple covers in a short amount of time right. saying like, these were my influences at the time. Kind of calling back, inviting people back to listen to your album. <laughs> Essentially, why are you releasing the cover? Yeah. 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 Um, a lot of strategy with covers too can be trying to drive up interest or just attention to it with like, um, audio clips with a, with a social campaign, sort of like what's driving, you know, how many covers of the song are already on the DSP and how can you get it kind of going, I guess. Mm -hmm. But again, what are your goals for the single right. or the, the cover? Why are you doing it? Right. And if you can tie it back, especially kind of to, back to your point of just like post release, you know, can you save that cover to tie back? Do you have some B sides of unreleased songs from the same session that you can tag back to it, um, just so you have some things going after. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about physical and, and digital, and kind of what, what are artists doing right now with, with a physical strategy, Mark? Um, well, I specifically believe we don't do physical anymore, really. I mean, there's about, <coughs> I would say like 95% were, digital mm -hmm. but there are some really cool campaigns that that artists do like um that kind of tie into their release strategy which is like you know one artist i work with 
you know, was releasing cassettes. And it was kind of like a cool concept of like, you know, going back to that era and um, it was really cool kind of merch opportunities as well, mm -hmm. um, tying in merch um, as part of the campaign. But truthfully, you know, for me speaking personally, um, you know, I, sp I did spend a lot of time, as Lori did, like in my older days, like dealing a lot with physical, but these days I do not. So just putting it out there. I do a lot of physical. I press a lot of records, make a lot of CDs. Despite what everyone tells you, and this is very genre dependent, CD is very much alive. We still sell a ton of them. Usually, even <coughs> on albums where you would not expect, like in hip hop or something like that, where you're thinking like this is going to be all vinyl, it's still about 50-50 when it comes to actually just like retail distribution. I will say numbers are kind of down across the board. Mm -hmm. um, that goes for vinyl too. I know that there's this supposedly this big vinyl revival going on, but that is slowing to some degree. So we have to be pretty careful with what we're doing manufacturing wise. <coughs> But the good thing is, you know, turnaround times are better. Prices have come down slightly. Yeah. Not at retail. Retail prices have not come down whatsoever to reflect that. Sorry to say. Um, what I will say about physical, physical product is it used to be the album was its own thing. And that's the only way you could hear something was to go out and buy the album. In a land of everybody having free, pretty much free access to all music all of the time, that, the strategy is completely different because it's now a merch item. It's a, it's a merch item like a t-shirt mm. or something like that. So we don't look to keep everything in stock 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we'll just let, the, like, we'll let an album go out of print, mm -hmm. you know, and just leave it out of print for a while and then bring it back with fanfare, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, for an anniversary. But uh, it is very different now. It is very much a merch item. Oftentimes people buy vinyl to look at it, you know, <laughs> frame just, it immediately. just to like, it's, you know, to, to have it. They just want to own it. You know, they don't own a turntable. They, they put it on a shelf uh -huh. and it is, I mean, it's their way of supporting artists. And I have zero, like, I have no issue with that whatsoever. However, anyone wants to support an artist is positive as far as I can see, but it is just a different way of looking at it now. Mm -hmm. For us, in, in being more in the roots genre, and we have a lot more sort of <coughs> album, you know, front to back listeners. Um, we'll we'll definitely push the pre-sale campaign hard. Try to get some sales, you know, before release day. Uh, we'll incentivize that. You know, we've got some limited edition, um, whatever you want it to be, or handwritten notes, or something that's like getting them, getting them to buy it before you know a couple months before. Um, we'll also really focus on the merch game. We focus a lot on bundles. Um, we do a lot of D to C print on demand. So. We don't have our artists with like boxes of things mm -hmm. in their basements. We get them to work on great designs, you know, like no one needs another t-shirt, but if it's a really great design or has a good story or meaning and, and it ties really nicely with the overall album campaign, um, you know, get those designs going, pick some different items that have different ranges of prices. You know, have a have a hundred dollar item if you want to, but have like a, a ten and a you know twenty or you know, uh, and the the print on demand is great because again it's just earn revenue. You didn't have to invest anything but the cost of the, of the design. Um, we use a website called Printful, and then we integrate Printful into Shopify, and then we push Shopify to the Spotify. So that's a way to actually make money on Spotify. Like we don't. But it's, it, it, it has a little more of a, uh, oh, Shopify the store. Yeah, it's like 150 bucks a month just to run. Yeah, person. yeah. 31, I think, for, yeah. the, for the starting one. With Printful, do you find that you have to, because I feel like you, you have to fill your wallet, right? So like it's print on demand, but there has to be uh, an account budget in your wallet so that when that shirt gets made, they're pulling from your wallet. Is that still how it operates? I don't know. Okay. I don't run the I don't run the merch. Uh -huh. But I, I don't think it's that. It's like meant to be no cost <coughs> to the artist. Like it's the cost to the buyer and then you up you mark it up. Okay. Yeah, like uh, I did do a couple of sales on there. Okay. And I knew that the purple wouldn't 
Like you had to, have, I had to have money in my printful digital wallet. Right. In it could be that to actually, to actually print, print it. it. Yeah. So like there is kind of an upfront, but you're at the same but time. But you're you're, you're making not some money, any money off money exactly. Until yeah, and again, it's it's yeah. having a couple items in the store. Yeah, you know, and you can make things limited, like a, a single exclusive for the single. You know, just yes. only yeah. for a month because you can just take those items down and do some new items. Yes. You can kind of see what works. Right. Um, in terms of just uh, you know, essentially using Spotify as another marketing platform, um, what are some other uh, ways that we kind of use Spotify to maybe generate, <laughs> you know? either more fans or, or funds. What, what are some kind of, I mean, I think the merch integration is a big one. Mm -hmm. I was that, like, that's yeah, yeah, it's, it, that's a really big one. We were really happy to see that come online because it actually, I mean, it gave us an excuse to set up a proper label store, which we'd never bothered to mm -hmm. do because we did so well with Bandcamp. It was like, why bother? Exactly. Um, but I'm kind of glad we're di diversified from Bandcamp at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I would say that, um, but also the ability to like link in tour information and update your artist bio and change your photos. How do you link in tour information? I don't do it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, we use a independent artist can use tour box by Songkick, and then you can also grab the embed from that page and put it into your website. So you only have to input your shows one time, and it's really it's not that hard. And then the followers that sounds in familiar. the different markets get notified when you're in their town which can help, you know, some, get some ticket sales off the platform. Um, also helps put some money in pockets. I will say like Amazon has a, has a, has a pretty solid merch integration too. I mean, say what you will about Amazon, cause I could say a lot, but um, <laughs> they do have a lot of really good tools and they now have a new merch integration with bands in town. So you can mm. actually link Amazon merch to bands in town and it can be um, on demand merch as well. So it's like, once again, mm -hmm. you know, your upfront costs are, pretty much next to nil. I'm not saying I've done it yet. It's on my list for this year to like start doing the integrations with Amazon. Mm -hmm. But it's great. You know, um, we have artists on our roster who understandably don't want to have anything to do with Amazon. So we're just going to respect that and go kind of artist by artist. Yeah, I think, um, you know, just also using everything that's available on Spotify. So, you know, yep. I mentioned this, the merch and whatever using all the tools on there like there's a new tool on there called clips yeah which you can do videos on there you there's the marquee tool which you can use for ads you know there's um you know for singles i always encourage artists to use the canvas option so there's a visual with your song you know there's just all the you know and i could use that for example for each dsp to be they honest. want you like, they want to see you using the platform exactly so like tools. it's kind of one of those things like you want to show the DSP that you're supporting it as much as possible, and it's reciprocal. Like it's a give and take relationship. It's a give and take relationship. So you know, for Apple, it's artist motion, album motion, like different. Dolby Atmos. Oh. Dolby, Dolby Atmos. <laughs> so it's like each each platform has their own sort of best practices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for for Amazon, it's like another new big thing is Spotlight and like things like that. So. I would say, like, you know, as an artist, is like taking advantage of those things and, like, what I was saying earlier, setting yourself up for the best chance to succeed. And, like, that would be, you know, just taking advantage of each um, DSP. And that's, you know, pick your battles um, because, like, make your playlist. Yeah. 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 It's, it's <laughs> because you're not going to have the resources, time to do that for. You know every single DSP that they can imagine, mm -hmm. like DSP or budget or budget. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and especially if you're doing everything yourself, right? So, you know, try to focus on the main things that Apple, Spotify, Amazon. That yeah. would be my suggestion. Um, yeah, and focusing on those and making sure your, you know, your picture is updated. Your, you've claimed your profile. You've you've done all the things, right? Like that's a big thing is claiming your profile that. A lot of artists don't remember to do right, so it's mm -hmm. that's that I would say that's the biggest thing to do yeah. in the beginning. So, well, thanks. We've got a couple of minutes left, so yeah. I just want to leave a little bit of space sure. for questions if there's any. Yeah, um, you know that you can pitch to playlists on Spotify for artists, but are there other ways that you can pitch for playlists? Yeah, uh, there's, there's different strategies like editorial versus curator playlists, which still have a good amount of followers. 
maybe you get some good streams, maybe people go over and follow you. Um, some, um, some tools you could use for that are um, Playlist Push or uh, Muso Soup, M-U-S-O Soup, uh, and Submit Hub. <coughs> and, and some labels use those tools as well. Those are paid or? Yeah. yeah. The one thing I would just caution, do your research on some of these third party lists mm -hmm. because especially like when we're talking about Spotify, they're really honing down on cracking down on on fake streams and stuff like that. So we just don't make sure use any of those services. Yeah, so just, just make like sure out of whatever an abundance of caution, it's mm -hmm. just like no. Don't whatever you're using, um, just make just do your homework to make sure it's legit and they're not fake and everything like that because there's a trickle down effect. Like it affects you as an artist, but it also is a strike against your label and mm -hmm. the distributor as well. Like when there's fraudulent, what they see is fraudulent streams. So when they see a bunch of yeah random streams from a country, like you're based yeah. in Toronto and yeah. all your streams are from India and like yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that does happen organically sometimes. Like we it joke does. all the time about how we're gonna get a gold record in Turkey before we'll ever get another one in Canada. Yeah, but hundred percent. It does. It does happen. So it does happen. Mm -hmm. but, but you can pretty much spot them out pretty quick. Yeah. Like just by eye. Not the ones that get emailed to you that say you were added to a playlist. Don't go there. Yeah. Um, in regards to if you get on a distributor and you're going through an album release cycle, um, what are some supplemental things that the artist can do that aren't directly associated with that release plan? Like, you know, maybe they're releasing demos on like a Patreon or something, or just things that kind of help that momentum build and kind of also build that relationship with the distributor? I mean, you wouldn't, putting out stuff through Patreon doesn't affect your distributor at all. They would have nothing to do with that. Um, so I don't know that it would really help that relationship. Uh, it might, I would think it would, might kind I mean, of detract from it, but someone else might have a different view. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it necessarily detracts from it. If you, again, it's just do, doing your own research and what's going to help you elevate your stature as an artist, right? So if you feel like doing some of these things, you know, that's outside of a distributor or label, is helping your career, you might want to check in with them just to, to get that feedback. Yeah, or actually I'm talking about more like you're, you're speaking with them and you know, they're saying, yeah, we're going to handle all this stuff, but here are some things that you can do kind of on your own that will also help that plan, that they're not going to be directly involved with. That would be a bit more, sounds like maybe more of a label relationship. Okay. Like with, with distribution, normally you're bringing the, the plan, like the overall plan, and, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, Finished goods. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, like that's the biggest thing between like difference. I guess you could say between a, a distributor and a label is, okay. you know, an artist is really uh, on a distributor basis coming with everything, right? Um, whereas a label, I think there's a little bit more hands-on um, building that plan for you, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so. I can't say that we specifically encourage like Patreon or anything like that, but we have had artists who've run very successful Kickstarter campaigns yeah. to raise additional funds to support them, like beyond the funds that we would be able to give them, and that's fine. I mean, if you have more a fan, money is good. Yeah, more money is yeah. always good. Like we are <laughs> all about putting money in the in the pockets of our artists. That's our main goal. At the back there. Hi, hey. uh, my name is Dempsey. Um, I wanted to go back to the cover conversation. Is it more worth it to do covers? Um, obviously, it's, it's more worth it to do covers that are super relevant, but is it still worth it to do covers that were made three years ago, five years ago? Oh, yeah, 100%. I have an artist that's going to do an entire album of someone else's stuff uh, in the next year. So. If it, if it means something to you as an artist mm -hmm. and, and you're passionate about it and you have a way to uh, use that to like build your profile and have something to talk about, I don't care when it was originally recorded. It could be from the 80s, from the 40s. Actually, I have two artists putting out whole albums of covers next year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 Uh, something Lori said struck me when uh, how they you basically look at sorry my name's Dan hey. um, that you basically look at albums uh, just as another uh, piece of merchandise mm -hmm. um, 
So obviously you, you're kind of focused on the other things that people buy, and t-shirts are an obvious one, but I, won't, I was wondering if there was other, um, other pieces of merchandise that you found people are, are keen to pick up. It depends on the genre and the age of your audience, the location of your audience sometimes even. Um, the best thing to do is ask, actually ask your followers what they would like to see so that you're, you're already one step ahead. You're not manufacturing a bunch of stuff that you might end up sitting on in a crate under your bed for the next six years. Um, like tote bags are always a, a, a solid one. They're relatively inexpensive to make. People still buy t-shirts, you know, keychains, like trinkety things. I, I have like a, an embarrassing amount of old swag from artists starting from like the mid nineties of just cool things I've been given over the years as working in the industry, kaleidoscopes, <laughs> sets of highlighters, uh, breath mints, you know, all different kinds of things. But the thing is, is like, does it make sense for the people who are listening to your music? Cause it's like, it might be cool, but if it doesn't speak to them, they're not going to spend mm. the money. So I would say just speak to your audience and get their input before spending any money at all. Yeah, good advice. Okay, maybe one more question, yeah. I was gonna ask you, um, you uh, looked really relieved to be off of Bandcamp. I always uh, learned Bandcamp to yeah. more money to artists. We're not relieved, we are still on Bandcamp and we still actively use it, but because of all the drama that's going on, I'm glad that we have something else already set up in case it goes south quickly. Because what's the drama? Oh, because okay. they've been sold twice, mm -hmm. and they've let go all of their editorial team, and, you know, we're still active on the platform, we still take part in Bandcamp Fridays, we donate a label share, if it doesn't, if our label share doesn't go to the artists on those days, it goes to charity, we support a number of different charities throughout the year, and that's where all of our Bandcamp funding ends up going. Um, so yeah, Bandcamp is a great thing, but us, for us as a business, I'm glad that we had the backup of having a Shopify store open so that if something happens pretty dramatically <coughs> at Bandcamp in the next year, we'll already be prepared for that. Thanks. One more? Sure. Uh, I thought it was really smart to plug in your store, your merch store to Spotify. Any other platforms that are great plugins for your merch or any sort of store? For merch? Yeah. Merch. Just make sure you also have it on your own website. You own that. So embed the same things there. Um, Amazon is good for merch, if you're okay with Amazon. Um, those yeah. are like a Apple doesn't have a merch plugin. No, not yet. And I and I haven't heard of one coming in the next year. That's a great point, though. Is like making it available. I mean, it, it seems like such an obvious thing, but not everyone thinks of it. Is like making it available on your own site. Also, say you have it. Or, like yeah. promote it. Yeah. If you can. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Mark, Believe, Lori, outside, next door, Jess, Neon Moon, thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of your sandbox.